G'day. The art of beekeeping is an ancient one, going back some 5,000 years ago to ancient Egypt. And scholars throughout the ages have been very aware of the strange breeding patterns of bees. For example, it is known that within any colony, only one bee, the queen, produces eggs. And if an egg happens to be fertilized by a male, then the egg will produce a female bee, which means each female bee has two parents, the female queen and the male bee. However, if the egg remains unfertilized, that egg will produce just a male bee, which means each male bee only has one parent, that female queen. And this leads to a very strange family tree for bees. For example, let's start with a single male bee. Has only one parent, the female queen. All right, but let's go back a generation. That female queen has two parents, uh, a male and a previous female queen. Okay, let's go back another generation. This male only has one parent, a female, but this female had two parents, a male and a female. All right, so there's the single bee, had one parent, has two grandparents, and there's the great-grandparents, three great-grandparents. Let's go back another generation. This female came from a male and a female bee. This male only has a single female parent, but this female has a male and a female parent, two parents. All right, so what am I up to? Great-great-grandparents, I think. Let's go back another generation if I can squeeze it in. This male has only one female parent. This female had a male and a female parent. This female had a male and a female parent. This male has only one female parent. And this female has two parents, a male and a female. Okay, just squeeze it in, just squeeze it in. All right, I'll stop there, stop there. So I've gone from a single bee, has a single parent, has two grandparents, has three great-grandparents, has five great-great-grandparents, and has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight great-great-great-grandparents. All right, so we can count the number of bees in each generation in the family tree, and we get the sequence, I'll call them the bee numbers. One, one, two, three, five, eight, and we can keep on going. And you look at the sequence up there and stare at it for a while, and you'll start to notice, for example, um, this eight is five plus three. This 5 is 3 plus 2. This 3 is 2 plus 1. This 2 is 1 plus 1. It looks like every number in the sequence is actually the sum of the two numbers just before it. Now, it could be coincidence with just the first six terms here, but if you keep going with this pattern, you'll see it always holds. And you can kind of see why it has to be true. Why must each term be the sum of the two previous terms? You can actually see it from this family tree. A little bit subtle, but let's give it a go. Okay, so here's the line of, uh, what do I say, great, great, great grandparents. I know it's eight, but I want to know philosophically, why should this number eight match this five for the next generation plus this three for the next generation after that? So why is this eight philosophically the same as this count of five and this count of three? And one way to get at that is to look at the number of females and then the number of males in that generation. So here's the number of females. One, two, three, four, five. There are five females up here. Oh, that's actually this matches this five here. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, the matching does make sense. So what I could do is say, okay, associate to each female its child. That is one child. This female has 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 one child. So actually, if I associate with each female its child, I can see there's a perfect matching between the number of females up here and I guess all the bees down here. So the number of females really has to be this five, the next generation. All right, so that's the females at this level. What about these males? There's three of them which suspiciously is like the three down here. Is there a lovely way to match these three males with those bees down yonder? Well, yes, because you think about it, I can associate with each male, not as child, I've already done that, but do the child child, go for its grandchild, well-defined. Each male has one grandchild, has this one grandchild. This male has this one grandchild. This male has this one grandchild. And if you think about it, every, male, every bee has only one male grandparent which means this matching is perfect. Every bee has one male grandparent, so that I can go back up this way and I know who got associated with where. Which means, which means, this is actually subtle, you have to think your way through that, but, oh, the number of males is perfectly matched with the number of bees two, generation two generations down. So this is the number of females at this level. This is the number of males at this level. Well, how many bees are there? Well, be all the females plus all the males must make up this number here. This eight must be this three plus this five philosophically. And do you know what? Eight is three plus five. We've got it, we've got it. So that's the kind of argument you can do from looking at family trees, why each number of the sequence is the sum of the two numbers before it. Just need to get going with a one and a one, and then off you go. You can generate this sequence. Beautiful, beautiful, and lovely. Now, 
Beekeeping really was just thriving throughout the millennia, and in particular during the 1100s, 1200s in Northern Africa, it was a big industry. And one very famous Western scholar by the name of Fibonacci went down to Northern Africa and was just smitten by the mathematics that was going on in that part of the world. That he decided he had to write about it and bring it back to Western Europe, and he did. And he actually noticed these numbers and wrote a little puzzle about them, not about bees, but made about rabbits instead. So in the West, the sequence of numbers became known as the Fibonacci numbers. Okay, meanwhile, in another part of the world, the subcontinent of India, other things were going on. Uh, scholars some 3,000 years ago in that part of the world were speaking Sanskrit, which was a famous ancient language admired for its beauty, for its, for its rhythm, for its metrics. It was just a stunning, beautiful, artistic language. And scholars actually studied the artistry of that language in particular. Around the 450 BCE, Pingala was actually playing with the meter of Sanskrit. And he was playing with elements of Sanskrit that could either be one syllable long or two syllable longs. And he was trying to write poetry based on one syllable and two syllable units. And he said, OK, well, if I want to write a line of poetry that has two syllables, so I want just two syllables, could I create it out of one and two syllable units? Well, yeah, it's a couple of ways. I could just use a two syllable unit, or I could use a one and a one. That will give me a two syllable line of poetry. So there was two options right there. How am I going to do this? I'm, I'm circling too many things. Uh, you want to write a three syllable line of poetry using one and two syllable units. Could you do that? Well, yes. You could do a two syllable followed by a one syllable, or you could do a one syllable followed by a two syllable, or you could do a one syllable, one syllable, one syllable uh, construction there. So actually, three ways to create a three syllable line of poetry. Four syllable lines. Using one and two unit syllables in Sanskrit, well, can I do it? You bet. I could do two and two. I could do two, one and one, or one, two and one, or two, one and one. I think I've got that. You probably can't read it. And I could do one, 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 one. He discovered there's five ways to create a four line, um, a four syllable line of poetry. And you can guess it, two, three, five. If you want to play with this, how many ways can you create the number five using one and two syllable units? Turns out to be eight of them. So actually, Pingala actually wrote down numbers two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, and so on and so on. Actually, wrote about these numbers as well. It's not clear to historians, in my understanding, that they, whether or not he was aware of the mathematical structure of this. But scholars kept playing with this in India, and they certainly were very much aware of the mathematics of these, this sequence of numbers. In fact, there's one famous scholar by the name of Himachandra who did write about this pattern of numbers um, and actually uh, talked about their mathematical structure and their mathematics. So in India, this beautiful sequence of numbers that tend to be known as the Himachandra numbers. So I've got three different names going on, and I'm sure these numbers appear in other contexts throughout human history. It's just wonderful. So I'm going to talk about today the magic of these numbers. So many people know many, many properties of these numbers. I want to go through some that actually I think are totally wild, weird, and surprising. So I'm going to go through a series of little puzzles and I'll give away all the answers because I do not want to skimp on the mathematics and actually share with you something I think is just mind-blowing. A little bit complicated, but mind-blowing because I've never seen this in the literature. So today we're going to go on a wild journey of these B numbers. And just to be very clear on this our notation, I'll call them the B numbers. So BN. BN is the nth B number. And we have that B1 is 1. There's the first one. B2 is 1. That's the second B number. And thereafter, Bn is the sum of the two previous B numbers. So I'm going to play with the B numbers. Whether you want to know them as the Fibonacci numbers or the Himachandra numbers or another name, all good and grand. I think Bs are kind of neat. So let's talk about Bs. Okay. Here's my first wild and unusual puzzle. In how many different ways can one place non-nested parentheses around a row of n dots? Okay, parentheses, brackets, whatever words you want, but I want non-nested parentheses. What, what could that mean? Okay, for example, here's a row of six dots. One, two, three, four, five, six. I want to place brackets around some or all of these dots, or none of them. Don't put any parentheses, parentheses around. That's one option. Leave it like it is. Or I could put parentheses, say, around those two. All right. I may put parentheses around just that one. I could do that as well. But I won't do this. I won't then put parentheses here because suddenly I've made these sets of parentheses nested within that one. I want non-nested, no nesting, so don't nest them. So maybe say I'll just do that and maybe I'll stop there. There's one way to place non-nested parentheses around a row of six dots. Okay, so to get a feel for what these numbers are, for these counts, uh, let's start with smaller numbers. Six is a lot, six is a lot. So let's just start with a simpler case, one dot. How many ways can I place parentheses around one dot and avoid nesting? One dot, leave as it is. That's definitely an option. Or, the other way, put parentheses around it 
and that'll be it. Because I'm not gonna put any more parentheses around because that'll be nesting, no nesting. So for one dot, I've got those two options. I either put parentheses around it or not, two options, there we are. All right, for two dots, here it goes. I can leave them as they are, just as two dots. Or I go to the extreme and actually put parentheses around both of them. Actually, I guess another extreme would be actually put parentheses around both of them, but individually. So there's a third option. Uh, what else can I do? I could put parentheses around one of them and leave the other one alone, or it's the other way around. And I have a feeling that's it. I think that's all I can do. So it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five options. There's five ways to place parentheses around two dots, avoiding nesting. All right, three dots. Let's do it. Uh, okay, I can leave them alone. I could go for the extreme. In fact, I guess there's different versions of extreme. I could do each of them individually with parentheses, or maybe do two of them with parentheses and uh, the other one with a single parenthesis and tell the way around. So that's everything is now parenthesized. Um, what else can I do? I can start leaving things alone. For example, I could just do one of them in parentheses and leave the other two alone. And I guess the other variations of that would be these. Um, I can do two of them in single parentheses and leave the two of them alone. And the variations of those, which I guess is this, dot, dot, and that. Anything else I could do? I guess I could do this sort of thing, do two in parentheses and leave the other one alone. And the variation. And I suspect I might have them all. I don't think I could do anything else. In which case, how many do I have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. There are 13 ways to put parentheses around three dots and avoid nesting. 2, 5, 13. 2, mm, 5, mm, 13. Looks like we're skipping these B numbers, going to every second B number. Which makes me suspect if I go one, two, three, four dots in a row, uh, two skip, five skip, 13 skip, there must be 55 ways to arrange parentheses around those four dots and avoid nesting. And if you'd like to have a tedious exercise to try it out, show me all 55 ways, double check that count. Turns out to be correct. But the puzzle is this. Why is the case that counting the ways to arrange parentheses around a row of dots matches every second B number for sure on the nose? Why are these connected to the B numbers? What's going on? It's wild. Okay, here's wild and unusual puzzle number two. In how many different ways can one write a number n as a sum of positive integers if there are two types of one? <laughs> what do I mean by that? So I've got the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I can use those numbers, but apparently there's two types of 1. I have a 1, I'll do a 1 with an upper bar and 1 with a lower bar. Okay, there's two different types of 1, but then it's 2, 3, 4. Okay, okay, this is strange. Let's look at the number 2. How many ways can I write a 2 as a sum of these positive integers? Well, I could just write it as 2, or I could write it as 1 plus 1, but, but, lots of choices for the 1. I could use both upper ones, or I could use both lower ones, or I could use an upper then a lower, or a lower then an upper, and I think that's it. Turns out there are five ways to express the number 2 as a sum of positive integers with two different types of 1. Huh. Um, three. How many ways can I write three as a sum of positive integers? Well, I could just leave it as three. I could do two plus one, but there's two choices there. Or I could do it as one plus two, but there are two choices there. Whoops, one plus two over here, one plus two, two choices. Uh, what else can I do? Oh, I could write it as one plus one plus one, one plus one plus one, but there's lots of choices. I could keep them all upper, I could make uh, first one upper, lower, then lower, da, da 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 Actually, there's eight options there. Eight ways to do choices of upper ones and lower ones there. So why have many options in all? Eight plus uh, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 ways. 13 ways to express the number three as a sum of positive integers with two different types of one. Uh, just for completeness, how many ways can I write the number 1 as a sum of positive integers with two types of 1? Well, I can use the upper one or I can use the lower one. Two options. Look at this. The count seems to be 2, 5, 13. You can double check. Write out all the ways to write the number 4 as a sum of positive integers with two different types of 1. I bet you'll get 55 ways. Why are we getting every second B number again? What's going on? Here's puzzle number three. When I sign off for my letters, I like to write X's and O's, hugs and kisses. But I have a rule. I do not like to give two consecutive kisses. Here's my question. In how many ways can I write a string of N, X's and O's, avoiding two consecutive X's? 
All right, okay, for example, if I want just one letter, string of just one term long, I could just write an O or I could write an X, I've got two options, leave it at that. If I want a string that's two letters long, I could write O, O, two consecutive O's is fine. I could write O, X or X, O, that's fine too, but I won't write X, X. I don't want consecutive X's, it's not going to happen. So for a string of two letters, I've got three options. Uh, for a string of three letters, let's do it. I could write nothing but hugs. I could do hug, hug, kiss, hug, kiss, hug, kiss, hug, hug. Um, I could, do, I could do two kisses, but I have to separate them with a hug and leave it at that, and I think that's all I can do, which gives me five options. Two, three, five, two, three, five. Check. Write out all the ways you can write a string of four X's and O's, avoiding two consecutive X's, and I bet you'll find there are eight ways to do it. So here's my question. Why is writing strings of X's and O's with a strange restriction actually matching these B numbers? What's going on? Okay, here's puzzle four, which is counter to puzzle number two. In how many ways can I write a number n as a sum of positive integers, but this time it's not having an excess of ones. Remember last time we had two different types of one. I want to completely avoid ones. No ones. Ones are now banned. In puzzle number two, we went extremely over the top with ones. Now I'm going to the other extreme. No ones whatsoever. So example, let's take a number like six. How many ways can I write six as a sum of positive integers avoiding the number one? Well, one way is just leave it as six. Um, I can't do five plus one, no ones, but I could do four plus two or the other way around, two plus four. Uh, what else can I do? Um, I can't split the two anymore. I can't do this three and one, but I could, oh, I could do two and two and two, or I could do three and three. That's another way to break six into a sum. And if you think about it, if I'm avoiding ones, that's it. I can't do anything more. Looks like there's uh, five ways to write six as a sum of positive integers, avoiding number one. Um, let's go down one. Let's go down to five. How many ways can I write five as such a sum? Well, I can leave it as five. Um, I can't do four, but I could do two and three and three and two. And if you think about it, that's it. I can't do anything more. There's only three ways to write five as a sum, avoiding the number ones. Um, let's go down again to four. I can do four, or I can do two plus two, and that's, that's it. Only those two options. Let's go down a notch to three. Actually, the only thing I can do is three. That's the only one option I have. Let's go down again to two. Again, only one option. I just have to write two. The only thing I can do, one option. The reason I did that is now I can see the numbers one, one, two, three, five. One, one, two, three, five. The B numbers. Whoa! What does this strange variation of writing numbers as sums, where this time we're now avoiding ones, still align with the B numbers? What's going on? This is crazy! Okay, here's my wild and unusual puzzle number five. In how many ways can I stack cannonballs on a row of n balls with rows being contiguous? Know what I mean by that? Here's a row of five balls and I'm stacking cannonballs up upon that row. The rows are like one great big row of five, one connected row of three, one connected row of one. Over here, I won't allow this example. I've got a row of connected row of five, but I've got this like split row of three. No split, it's not contiguous. Don't want that. I want to make sure every row has all the balls being consecutive on that row. Grand, good. All right, so how do we do this? Uh, let's play with some small numbers. If I've got a row of one ball and I'm trying to stack things on top of it, I can't do this sort of stacking pattern. So there's only one thing I can do, leave as it is, one option for one ball. For two balls in a row, I can have a couple options, leave as it is, or I can actually sneak a ball on top and start some stacking. And that's it, there's only two options. Okay, for three balls, I could leave them as they are, I could actually put one ball there, or I could put one ball there, or I could put two balls there, or I could put two balls there again and then stack another ball. It looks like there's actually five ways to stack uh, on a row of three. One, two, five. Ooh, ooh, maybe we're skipping again. Maybe it's this one, skip two, skip five, skip 13. Are there 13 ways to put cannonballs on a row of four balls? Let's find out. Let's see if I can do it. One, two, three, four. Leave them alone. One, two, three, four, and one. One, two, three, four, and one. One, two, three, four, and one. 
Um, I don't want to split them, but maybe I could do one, two, three, four, one and one, or maybe one, two, three, four, one and one with one on top. Or I could put those two over here, one, two, three, four, one, two, or one, two, three, four, one, two, and one on top. Um, maybe the next one I could do a row of three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. Oh, 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 one, two, three, that's this example. I'm gonna leave it as a three like that, or this pattern, this pattern, this pattern. So that's gonna to lead to another five examples, which means I have a total of, for four cannonballs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and five makes 13. Yes, indeed, 13. So here's my next question. How can we see our way through those B numbers and realize that these B numbers, at least every second one, is counting stacking, ball, stacking cannonball patterns? Wow, there's a lot of connections going on. The fun just doesn't stop. Here's puzzle number six. Um, this one's hard to describe, so I'm just call it weird products. But we were doing weird sums of numbers before, but the connection with those sums of numbers goes even deeper in terms of these B numbers. For example, we had three, which left us three, or we could write as one plus two, or two plus one, or one plus one plus one. We're splitting up in different ways to write as sums. But do the following. Make little products out of these sums. Three is just three. One times two is two. Two times one is two. One times one is one. And then add up all these products. Three plus two plus two plus one equals eight, which is a B number. Coincidence? Let's try it again. Write all the ways to write four as a sum. Let's leave it as four. Do one and three. Make, make it a product. Three times one. Uh, two times two. Two times one times one. One times two times one. Two times one times one. And one times one times one times one. I think that's all the ways we can do it. Work out these products. Uh, four, three, three, four, uh, two, 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 and one. Add them up. Uh, that's 10, 16, uh, 21. It's a B number. Whoa, whoa. Try it out with the number two. Try it with the number five. Try it with the number 10. Are you getting B numbers every single time? Do you know what? You are, you will. Why, why, what's going on? Okay, for my seventh question, I'm making it a little more theoretical this time. Because these B numbers have a lot of magical structure. People have known about it for a while, but it's all kind of curious. There's one particular piece of structure that actually has fascinated me for a good number of years. Now, these B numbers are defined in an additive sort of way. They're about addition. 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 3 is 5. 3 plus 5 is 8. That's how you get up to the B numbers by actually doing addition. Yet there's a strange multiplicative property that's actually true. People have known about this for a long while. It's curious. If if n is a multiple of a, then the nth b number is sure to be a multiple of the eighth b number. For example, 12 is a multiple of 6. 12 is a multiple of 6. Okay, well what's the 12th b number? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 144. So b12 is 144. I claim 144 is a multiple of the sixth one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is 8. B6 is 8, and lo and behold, the 12th B number is a multiple of the 6th B number. And that's true in general. Okay, we're definitely going to prove that today, for sure. We'll, we'll prove that. But here's the thing that I've never seen in the literature. Okay, so I know that BN is a multiple of BA. Can I get a formula? Find a formula for the quotient. Find a formula for BN divided by BA. What's the actual formula for that number? We had 144 divided by 8. There's going to be something about the, that quotient. What can I say about the quotient in general? Let's go further. What if n's not the multiple of a? There's some remainder. Then bn's not going to be a multiple of ba. There'll be some remainder. What must the remainder be? What's the multiple of the remainder? So can we actually go beyond what's in the literature? As far as I'm aware, let's take the standard facts been known for centuries and push it even further to something new today. Whoa, let's do that at the end of this video. So obviously, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. I want to actually explain all those puzzles, all six of them, and actually go to this brand new territory, all by thinking about bees. And we are going to literally think about bees as we go through this work next. Okay, deep breath. We're ready for it.
Okay, here's another remarkably beautiful appearance of the bee numbers. And it's still to do with bees. It's about honeycomb, walking in honeycomb. Here I've got two rows of honeycomb cells. I'm over here in this cell. I want to walk over to this cell from neighboring cell to neighboring cell. But I put a little restriction. I always want to make sure I'm moving to the right because I could do a horizontal step directly to the right from one cell to its neighbor. But I could also do diagonal steps as long as they're slightly to the right. For example, this diagonal step downwards to the right has rightward motion to it. That's great. Or I can do actually diagonal steps upwards. As long as they lean a little bit to the right, that's good. That's bringing me to the right. So all my motion is to the right. So taking horizontal steps or rightward diagonal steps, how many ways can I go from start to end in this picture? Two rows of honeycomb. And you can start drawing paths. You can say, here's one way. You can do something like this. Well, that was fun. Or I can do something like that. That'd be fun. Or I can actually do something like that. Lots of different ways. You can do a complete zigzag if I want. That would be fine. Or I can do definitely sort of weird things in between. Turns out there's lots of ways. Gonna be, that's going to be very hard to count. So let's just get a feel for it and make the picture a little bit smaller. Suppose my end wasn't there. Suppose my end was there. Let's go for a very really easy one. And you realize, OK, my end was there. Uh, how do I go from start to end? Well, you can just do a, a downward diagonal step. I'm going to go diagonal. That'd be fine. Done. One way. I can't go horizontal because then to get down here, I'm going to have to go backwards. I have to go in the leftward direction. Not allowed. So actually, there's only one way to get there. It would have to be that diagonal step. All right. This cell, suppose that was my end. How many ways can I get there? Well, I could just, from the start go directly across, horizontal step, or I could go diagonal, diagonal, that would be fine. And if you think about it, that's it. I'm going to go this way or this way. There's only two ways to get to there. All right, now things get a little more interesting. Um, this cell, um, how many ways can I get here? And I could play with it directly. For example, I could just try, I could go down and across, or I could go across and then down, or I could go do a zigzag, and you'll find there's three ways one, two, three. But then think about it, think about it. This cell here, how can I get here? Now it's getting a bit harder. And I say, all right, all right. I know there was two ways I could get myself here, and I can say, do those two ways and directly step across. Or I could get myself here, there's three ways I could do that, and do any one of those three ways and directly step across. That would land me here, which means there must be two plus three. Two plus three is five ways I could walk a path there. If you're not sure what happened just then, try it out. List out all five ways to get there. That's manageable. And you'll see that two of them went through here and stepped across. Three of them got used to here and stepped over. So actually, that gives me a general idea. How many ways can I get here? Well, get myself to that, to that cell up there. There's one of five ways and step across. There's five ways to get across over there. One of five ways to get there and step across. Or get yourself here and step across directly with a horizontal step. It means there must be five plus three. There are eight ways to get there. We are generating the B numbers. The B numbers. Each term in this, the next, the term in the next cell is the sum of the previous cells. To get here, either get yourself here and do one of the eight, one of the eight paths there and step across eight ways, or get yourself here, one of five ways, step across another five ways. There must be eight plus five, 13 ways to get there. In general, if I'm going, say, from A ways to get there, B ways to get there, how many ways to get here? Get yourself here somehow, one of B ways. Get yourself, here with some of one of, get yourself here somehow, one of A ways. Therefore, the total number of ways to get here must be all B plus all A, A plus B ways, ways. That is exactly the structure of the B numbers. We are now creating the B numbers again. So actually, to answer the question, which I believe, well, this is my N cell over here. Uh, 8, 13, that must be 21. That must be 34. This must be 55. That's 89. And that's 144. Start and there are 144 ways in this particular picture. Wow. Wow. Uh, just to be very clear, we've got one, two, three, five, eight. The first one should be a one, which kind of makes some sense if you like. Maybe we'll say there's one way starting here and to get here, namely is the one way is to do nothing. You're already there, just, just sit still. One way to do that, sit still. So if you like, we've got now got the complete sequence of the B numbers as path counts. Beautiful, beautiful. So, so what we got here? The number, so think of this as a zigzag. I've got this zigzag here of uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's the 12th B number. 12th B number is 144, and I've got 12 cells along the zigzag path. So what we've observed here, that the nth B number, nth B number is the number of paths uh, uh, between N cells along the zigzag. So to practice that, to practice that, uh, what am I going to do this? I'm going to do this. Let me clean this board. Well, clean this board, making it messy here. So our B numbers were, I don't know why I erased them, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and so on. If I want to start here and end here, 
I say to myself, okay, how many paths would there be? Well, it's like start and end is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's a zigzag of six cells. It must be B6, one, two, three, four, five, six. There must be eight ways to walk between those two starting points. Whoa. Or if I want to say this one, so I want to start here and end here. Okay, if I want to do that one now, start here, so that's a zigzag. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's a zigzag of nine cells. There must be B9 ways to walk between those two cells, starting here, ending here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 34 ways. 34 ways. So now I can look at pictures and say, how many ways are they walk from here to here? Oh, one, two, three, four, B4. One, two, three, four, three. Three ways to walk from there to there, and so on. Did I get that right? One, two, three, four, yes, yes, good. All right, that's the structure we're gonna play with. This thing about this little diagram of honeycomb, two rows of honeycomb, explains all seven puzzles I went through. Everything falls out of this picture. So let's go through it now. We're gonna go through all seven puzzles again. This is a long video, but you can just skip around as you like, what the parts that interest you. We will explain every single puzzle by just looking at this picture. It's magical. Okay, to explain the nested parentheses puzzle. Um, here I've drawn a honeycomb with two rows. Um, I've just put dots in the center because it's easier to think of dots here and see what's going on. My pictures are a bit wonky in places. Um, what I've got here is um, eight cells on the top, seven cells on the bottom. I've drawn a picture of 15 cells. And I'm gonna look at paths that start at a top cell and end at a top cell. Uh, for example, one path could be something like this. Maybe I start here, come down, go along there for a spell, go up, go along there for a spell, touch down, go back up. There we are. Top cell to a top cell. Great. Now, here's the thing about paths that start at the top and start at the top. Look at where they touch down on the cells on the bottom. I've got this row of dots here. I see those three got connected. That one got connected by itself. It's like I put parentheses right there and right there. Every path from a top cell to a top cell actually corresponds to putting parentheses around the dots on the bottom cells. Whoa, and I'll never see nesting. In fact, if I give parentheses first, for example, here's a set of parentheses, I put those around parentheses, maybe I'll put those around parentheses, and maybe I'll put that one in parentheses. If I give a set of non-nested parentheses first, that corresponds to a path. You can see what the path is. It has to be this. Oh, come down to that one, use it. But don't stay long, go back up for a while. Come down to this one, okay, I must do that. Use those two, connect them. Come back up. Oh, I want to use that one and connect with that one, go up, and I must be doing that. Whoa. Every path from top cell to top, top cell corresponds to non-nested parentheses on the bottom dots, and every set of non-nested parentheses on, on bottom dots gives you a path from top cell to top cell. So the number of ways to put non-nested parentheses around a set of n dots, if there's n dots here, n dots here, n dots here, there must be one more here, n plus one dots there, corresponds to the number of paths I could draw from there to there using all n plus n plus one dots, all two n plus one dots. The number of non-nested parentheses, non-nested parentheses for n dots, how's that for table writing, is b two n plus one. Indeed, every second, b number, the ones that are in the odd positions. That's it, wow, the two, the five, the 13, the 34, and so on. We've got it, we've got it there. Beautiful, that explains non-nested parentheses. Okay, puzzle number two. The number of ways to decompose a number n as a sum of positive integers, but using two different types of number one. Okay, I claim that actually corresponds to paths in two rows of a honeycomb. So let's look at the number of ways to decompose the number eight in such a manner. And to do that, I'm gonna look at eight cells on the bottom row and nine cells on the top row, because I wanna look paths that start in the top cell and end on a top cell. So I have nine cells on top, eight on bottom. I'm gonna focus on the eightness of this picture. And I claim, in fact, any path I draw from this top cell to that top cell gives me a decomposition, decomposition of the number eight. For example, let me just draw something like this at random. Uh, 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 there we go. There we go. That's good. So there's a path. I claim that corresponds to a way to write the number eight in this funny way. And the way I'm going to do that is look at all the top cells that were visited by this path. And I'm going to say, okay, between the dots that I've got highlighted there, what's the count of spaces between them? Now I've got nine cells on top, there's eight spaces between them, that matches the eight cells on the bottom. So from there to there, I went one space. From here to here, I went one, two, three spaces. From here to here, I went one, two spaces. From here to here, I went one space, and here I went one space. Great. Oh, oh, 
one, three, two, one, one, adds up to eight. Yep, that's all eight spaces. That's a decomposition of the number eight. But actually, I have two different types of one going on here. To go this one dot to this dot, I actually went sort of downwards. I did like a lower one there. Whereas for this one, I stayed on the upper level. That's like an upper one. Here, I also stayed on the upper level. There's an upper one. For these guys, I have no choice. They have to happen on the lower level. Only the ones have flexibility. Do I want an upper one or a lower one? So actually, what I've got a decomposite here is the decomposite of here is the decomposition of the number eight. Excuse me, I'm fumbling. But there's two different types of one, and all of the numbers come in the same type. Whoa, that does it. That does it. In fact, if I change this to a lower one, I know exactly what to do for the path. Oh, it changes to a lower one. This changes to a lower one. Oh, that must be doing this to the path. That's great. In fact, you can see if I give you the decomposition first, any decomposition of the number eight using two different types of one, it really will correspond to a path. We've got a perfect correspondence between decompositions and paths. Now, there are eight dots along here, eight cells, nine cells up here. I've got a total of 17 cells, which means I know the number of paths is B17, the 17th B number. Therefore, the number of decompositions is B17, the 17th B number. In general, for the right, rewriting number n as a sum of positive integers with two different types of one, I have n cells here, n cells, I have one more cell up there, n plus one cells, which means I have a total of n plus n plus one, two n plus one cells, the number of paths is b, two n plus one, therefore the number of decompositions is indeed the uh, every second, every second b number, the ones in the odd positions, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the b numbers in the odd positions correspond to these decompositions. That's it, that's puzzle number two, we got it. Okay, puzzle number three. The only way to write a string of n x's and o's avoiding two consecutive x's. Again, it's path counting. So here I've got here some cells, two rows of a honeycomb. And what we do this time is actually really focus on the zigzag and how I usually count the cells along this, these two rows. And any path I claim matches a sequence of x's and o's if I give the x's and o's a special meaning. For example, I could have a path that starts here, but it'll start at the beginning and end over here. Maybe a path is like this. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, 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 something like that. Now, if I follow the zigzag pattern, I can see I used some cells and I didn't use others. So let's put an O for used, O for used, O for used, X for skipped, used, used, skipped, used, used, skipped, uh, uh, used, used. So that gives me a sequence of X and O's. O means I used that cell, X means I skipped it. And in fact, you'll see you'll never get two consecutive X's. If I had two consecutive X's, like I skipped this cell and skipped its neighbor, that means I've actually skipped both those cells and have a break in the path, which case it's not a path. You'll never see two consecutive X's. Also, you might say, well, well, well James, you'll never see an X at the beginning, and you'll never see an X at the end. Some of these strings could, could begin with an X, could end with an X. That's okay, because I can say to myself, well, I will always use the beginning O, I will always use an end O, I know they're going to be there, so don't bother writing those down. Just ignore the, just, just focus on the interior part. We know it's going to begin and end in, begin and end in an O, therefore, X's could happen anywhere else right there, really then does correspond to a sequence of X's and O's with no other restrictions other than you won't have two consecutive X's. And you know, if I give you a random sequence of X's and O's like this with no two consecutive X's, like that, you could actually translate that back to being a path. You know there's going to be an O at the beginning, and there's going to be an O at the end. You actually say, follow the zigzag, skip that dot, skip that dot, and you can just get a path. So now we've got a perfect correspondence between strings of X's and O's, avoiding consecutive X's, and path counting. Therefore, the number of counts of these must actually match the B numbers. Whoa. Okay, puzzle number four. The number of ways to write n as a sum of positive integers, this time completely avoiding the number one. No ones. All right, so what I've drawn here is another picture. It's path, path walking, of course. A picture of two rows of a honeycomb. I've drawn uh, 12 cells in total in this case, and I've actually highlighted the zigzag. I've got uh, uh, 12 cells means there's 11 zigs and zags in this picture here, 11 sections of the zigzag. But let me be a little bit sneaky. Let me act, add an extra zag at the end, an extra zig at the beginning. So now I've got 13 sections of this zigzag. Zigzag. 12 cells, 13 zigzag sections. Now, I claim uh, any path you draw from start to end does something interesting to that zigzag diagram. In fact, let me draw a path. Let's go for something like this. Uh, uh, uh. 
Uh, uh, uh. There we go. That's a fine, fine path. So what I've, what's happened here is I've again missed some cells. They actually break up the zigzag pattern. For example, missing this one means, okay, I've got a break right there in my zigzag. Missing this one means I've got a break right here in my zigzag. Missing this one means I've got a break right here. And missing this one means I've got a break right here. So that means, okay, I've broken my 13 section of zigzag into a section of three zigzags. One, two, three segments. One, two, three segments there. One, two, th oh, I don't know, sorry. One, two segments there. Uh, one, two, three segments there. And two segments there. And yes, that's all 13 segments. Great. All right. Now, you can see I'll never see the number one up here. If I had uh, a break and a break to get one section, that means I would need a break and a break right next to each other, which means my path never went through here, nor did it go through here. My path never went through those, that little uh, uh, region right there. It means my path was broken. It wasn't a path. So I'll never see ones on the interior. And I'll never see ones on the exterior as well because I made sure I put in this extra, extra zag here so I'll see the one maybe and then another one to get me up to two. Here it was fine. I had one, two. I would have seen a two, but I put an extra one there and made it, made it three. So an extra one. So basically what I've got now is a decomposition of the 13 segments of my zigzag coming from 12 cells and I never see the number one. I've got a decomposition of the number 13 using 12 cells. In fact, every path along these 12 cells gives me a decomposition of the number 13 in such a manner. Whoa, whoa. So if I want to decompose the number n in such a manner, I want n items on my zigzag, which means I want n minus 1 cells, which means I'll be counting b n minus 1 paths. The number of ways to write a number n as a sum of integers avoiding number 1 is actually the n minus 1th b number. Whoa, there it is. You've got to love these b numbers. You've got to love this path counting. And it keeps going. Let's do more. Okay, the cannonball puzzle. Here's a picture of a stack of cannonballs on a row of seven balls. And I'm going to look at this picture and say I can link this to paths in honeycomb. I claim this picture corresponds to a path in some honeycomb picture. How? How? Okay, here's what I'm going to do. This is based on seven balls on the bottom row. So I'm going to start with a honeycomb of seven cells. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So here's a, a row of seven cells in a honeycomb. And I am going to stack honeycomb above this because balls were stacked above here. I'll stack a row of cells above this. Uh, okay, here comes my second row above it. It's now just six cells. Now, even though the stacking keeps going higher and higher and higher, I'm not going to do any more stacking. I only want a honeycomb a picture of two rows and that's it. It's as high as this picture is going to go. Nonetheless, even though my stack goes higher, there's still a way to uh, interpret this stacking picture as a path in this picture. It will go from this cell here to that cell there. In fact, let me just draw all the dots. So there's the seven dots on the bottom, matching the seven balls on the bottom, and an extra height of dots above that. All right, here goes. Here's how to get a path from this picture. What I'm going to do is actually outline the shape of the path. I do a diagonal step up. Then I do a diagonal step up. So diagonal for up, diagonal step. Then I do a horizontal step, H for horizontal. Then I do a diagonal step upwards. Then I do a diagonal step, this time it's downwards. Then I do another diagonal step, and then another diagonal step. Downwards, downwards, downwards. Then I did a horizontal step, and then a horizontal step. All these diagonals and H's actually do span across the seven dots at the bottom. Each horizontal, stop, um, horizontal step uh, spans one space between two consecutive dots. Even over here, right, one space between two consecutive dots. And each diagonal step, be it up or down, spans half a space between two dots on the bottom. All right, so all these D's and H's, the D's are worth a half and the H's are worth one, you know, half a space, one space, will actually match all the spaces between the bottom dots. Oh, oh, all the space between the bottom dots, all the space between these bottom dots. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy these instructions exactly for this picture as best I can, knowing I can't go above a height of two. Here goes. I'll start where I'm meant to start, right there. Do a diagonal step. Okay, I can do that. Do another diagonal step. Well, I can't do diagonal up. I will do diagonal down instead. It's the best I can do. Do a horizontal step. I can do that. Do a diagonal step. I guess it must be that. Do a diagonal step. No choice. It has to be that one. Do a diagonal step. Okay. Do another diagonal step. Okay. Uh, do a horizontal step. Yes. Do a horizontal step. Yes. 
That's it. That's it. This set of D's and H's did actually span across all seven dots at the bottom. All D's like went half a space between them. All H's went a full space. Everything adds up perfectly to make a path from there to there. Whoa. Whoa. You can play with it. Every picture of a cannonball stack does correspond to a path between these seven cells on the bottom and six cells on the top. There's 13 cells in total. And for practice, it's actually good to go backwards. Just draw a random path amongst these 13 cells and you'll be able to translate it back to a cannonball stack. There's a perfect correspondence here. Play with it, it's kind of fun to do it. Which means, oh, oh, if every cannonball stack corresponds to a path amongst these 13 cells, that means the number of possible cannonball stacks must be B13, the 13th B number. Whoa! And in general, you can see now if I have n cells on the bottom, I'll draw n cells, uh, sorry, n balls on the bottom here, I'll draw n cells on the bottom here, n minus 1 cells will be on the top row, then I'll be having a path between uh, n plus n minus 1 to n minus 1. The number of ways to stack cannonballs on a row of n balls must be the 2th minus 1th B number. Whoa! Again, it's every second B number, uh, the ones in the odd positions, these ones. There it is. It is just magical. And do you know what? The fun keeps on going. Okay, puzzle number six and things are getting weird now. Remember, we did all the ways to take a decomposition of a number, but we actually multiplied everything together, got all these products, add them up, and we got another B number. Crazy, 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 crazy. Again, it's path counting. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the number 12 of this example. I did 12 cells on top, 12 cells on the bottom, and I actually talk about paths. A path that starts on the top cell and ends on a bottom cell. 12 and 12. Okay. And what I'll do now is to think about, okay, what are the possible locations of the up steps of any path I make? For example, I might have an up step here. There'll be an up step. Maybe I have an up step over here. Another one over here. And maybe I have an up step here. All right, okay. So I've just inserted some up steps. So it could be four of them, could be two of them, could be nine of them. Maybe nine, I don't know how many, what, six of them, seven of them, something like that. Uh, Twelve of them, nine of them, yes, or none of them, none of them. But I do know that in any section between the start and an up step or between up steps, I need to have a down step. So let's count all the possible ways I can insert a down step. Now here I can insert a down step from here or here. Down step that way, down step here. But I definitely need to get down to there. I need a down step. So there's two places, those two right there, I can insert a down step. Here, I can insert a down step here or here or here or here or here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five possibilities of where I can it's do that down step. For here, I've only got one option. The down step must be here. I've got to end up down there. So there's only one option where to place the down step there. Here, I've got one, two possibilities right there. Down step. Here I've got one, two possibilities for the down step. In fact, each of these top cell locations can be a down step, but I see I've got two and then five and then one, then two, then two choices. Then I've got two times five times one times two times two choices. That is, this is a decomposition of the number 12. I believe this adds up to 12. Yes, it does, because I had those 12 dots at the top. And what I've done is made the product. So once I choose a down step, choose these down steps, then the, path, the rest of the path is determined. Whoa! So, so, every decomposition of the number 12 tells me basically where I'm placing the up steps and all the ways I can place down steps. All these possible decompositions must cover all possible paths. All possible paths I could make. So if I add up all these decompositions, I must be adding up all the paths I can do. Well, I'm doing 12 cells at the bottom and 12 cells at the top. I've got 24 cells in total. I must have B24, the 24th B number, to actually count all the paths. In general, if I'm playing this game with the number N, I must be just adding up all my different options for counting paths. The answer must be N dots on the bottom, N dots on the top, B to N. It must be the 2 nth B number. Yes, I'm doing every second B number this time, uh, but the ones appearing in even positions, these ones here. Whoa, whoa, this is subtle and amazing and fabulous. I mean, my brain is really hurting right now. This is a very long video and I'm just throwing stuff out at us. But there it is. Take it in stock, take it slowly, take deep breaths, pause, or don't watch anymore. But let's keep going, because this is cool.
Okay, there are many famous identities about the B numbers, and here's an example of identity. Apparently, the A plus B plus one B number equals the product of the A and B B numbers plus the product of the A plus one and B plus one B numbers. Okay, what did I just say? Let's do an example. Um, okay, let's look at the eighth B number and think of this as B as th uh, three plus four plus one. According to the identity, I could think of this as uh, B3 times B4 plus B1 more, 4 times B1 more, 5. Is that true? So what's the eighth B, B number? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's 21. So 21 apparently equals the third one, uh, 2 times the fourth one, 3, plus the fourth one, 3, times the fifth one, 5. Uh, 6 plus 15, Yes, it's 21. It's 21. So actually, you can prove many identities like these by thinking about, lo and behold, path walking. For example, here's a picture of A plus one, A plus B plus one cells. Um, I've did a clump of A cells here, followed by a clump of B cells there, with this one cell that's sort of in between the two clusters. So I'm going to ask how many paths are there from start to end. Well, I know there's A plus one, uh, A cells plus B cells plus one more. There are A plus B plus one cells in total. So the number of paths is this. The total number of paths is indeed that number. But I can classify the paths two ways. Those that actually avoid the special cell or those that go through that special cell. All right, so I've got equals all the paths that go through the special cell and all the paths that avoid the special cell. In fact, let me do the ones that avoid it first. The only way they can avoid it is to actually do this. They must get here, not go down, must do a path like this. So that has to be any path that somehow goes across to here, then doesn't jump down to it, oversteps it, and then carries on and does paths here. So right now I need to look, figure out all the heavy paths there are amongst these A cells. Oh, there's BA of them. And how many ways can I do paths amongst these B cells? Oh, BB of them. Oh, the total number of paths in total must be the product. This, the, this many choices and that many choices, the total number of choices must be that product. So this is the total number of paths that avoid this special cell. Now, how do I actually use that special cell? Well, actually, then I think of this as a cluster then of A plus one cells. I've got to use this, I've got to use that. So I'm gonna go from here to here, somehow do it. Get there to there. How many ways to do that? Oh, B, A plus 1, or A plus the extra 1. Now that I'm here, I'm going to now use these, that cell and these B cells, so think of the clusters over here now, to go from that point to that point. And I know there are B, B plus 1 paths from there to there. Oh, so the total number of paths that use that special cell is that product. Oh, that's exactly the identity, I said the other way around. Okay, beautiful. So that's how you think your way through many of these wonderful B number identities. So um, feel free to play with that sort of stuff, because I want to go to my favorite one now, and that's that new... Okay, what I've got on the screen right now is horrific. It absolutely looks terrifying. Um, can I make sense of it? Well, actually, yes. It's going to be much easier to prove this thing to, than to pass what's on the board right now. Pro the proof is actually beautifully visual of what this stuff is. So um, don't be horrified by this. But what I'm, what I'm doing here is that seventh puzzle. Remember, uh, it's well known that if n is a multiple of a, then the nth b number is sure to be a multiple of the a, a eighth b number. For example, we look at this example. Let's say the number 12 is definitely a multiple of 6. It turns out the 12th b number is 144. And it's true, it turns out to be a multiple of the 6th b number, which is 8. 144 is a multiple of 8. So there's an amazing multiplicative property to the b numbers, which is strange because they're actually defined by addition. You've got to love it. That's actually astounding and beautiful. But then I was personally wondering, well, OK, if bn is a multiple of ba, then what's an actual formula for that quotient? There is one. It's this. It's this. Um, if n equals qa is that actual multiple, then here is a form. It's the sum of this b number plus the product of those two b numbers plus the product of those, those b numbers all up to the product of those b numbers. Little cascading um, sums of powers things going on. Okay. Don't, don't bother trying to pass that. My point is, it's possible to write down the formula, and when I'll show you the visuals in a moment, you'll say, okay, I could recreate it for myself. It seems straightforward, which is amazing, which is amazing. That's what I love about visuals, the power of visualization in mathematics. And then, of course, you want to go further. Well, if it's not a perfect multiple, what if n doesn't equal q times a? What if n equals q times a plus some remainder, r? Then what's the general form for this quotient? 
Well, it's going to be basically the same thing here. This horrible, messy stuff doesn't quite go all the way down as it did before because you've got you're off by R. That's fine. But then you get this remainder term. Here's the remainder. I can actually write down the remainder, still waiting to be divided by uh, the eighth B number as well. So my point is, in the pictures I'm going to show next, you could actually create these messy looking, scary looking formulas for yourself because the concept behind getting these is actually beautiful and straightforward. It's just counting paths. So let me clean the board and count paths. Okay, this is exciting. Here's how to prove something that looks ghastly when you write it in algebra, but conceptually it's straightforward. I have drawn N cells here, zigzag of N cells in two rows of honeycomb. N is QA plus R, so a multiple of A plus a remainder. So I've actually highlighted where the eighth cell is, the two eighth cell is, the three eighth cell, all the way up to the Q eighth cell, and there's an extra R cells at the end. R could be zero if we've got a perfect multiple. All right, I'm gonna count the number of paths from start to end. All right, now we know that answer is actually uh, BN. BN is uh, QA plus R, all of them. But it's going to be composed of the cells that either go through this one or miss this one. So let's count how many cells actually go through the eighth one. Well, I have to go from here to here. That's A cells. I know there's B A ways to go from there, from there to there, so those first A cells, which then leaves me uh, N, uh, N minus A plus the extra one. There are N minus A plus one cells to go from here to here. I know there are actually B N plus one minus A ways to do that. So this is the number of paths that actually go through A. All right, plus the number of paths that don't go through A. These are the ones that actually do this instead. All right, so they're the ones that do that instead. Amongst those paths that don't go through A, some of them will go through 2A, some of them won't. So let me count those that go through 2A and then add to that the ones that don't. All right, how many paths uh, go from here to here, then from here to here, and then from here to there? Product of three things. I know there's actually a B A minus one ways, B A minus one ways to do that part of the journey. I know there's actually, uh, that's gonna be uh, B A ways times B A ways to do that part of the journey. And this is actually the rest of it. So it's N take away two A plus an extra one, B N plus one take away 2a. So if you're really taking notes of what the formula is looking like, I'm actually creating that formula right now. There are all the paths that go through 2a, plus I'm going to add to that all the ones that are still missing a and also now miss 2a that do this instead. All right, let's do that. Plus all the ones that go from here to here, then here to here, then here to there. Let's go, th let's go through 3a and then also avoid 3a. Going through 3a, I've got b a minus one ways there. Uh, another B A minus one ways there. That's two of them. I've got B A ways there times B of A plus the rest of the ways would be B N plus one minus three A this time. And we'll keep on going all the way along up to the Q eighth uh, cell. In which case the formula is going to be, if you just follow this formula, is B A minus one Q minus one times um, B A B to the N plus one minus Q A. N plus one minus QA. If you just sort of read your way through, it's gonna go all the way up to that cell there. Uh, if it goes through there, but I wanna do the ones that miss everything, fine, the miss that that, uh, plus, plus a final term, a remainder term, uh, miss, 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 it's gonna be A minus one uh, Q times this time, and then the final step, BR, BR. Whoa, whoa. By the way, N plus one minus QA, N minus QA is just R plus one right there, R plus one. So, so, if it turns out R is zero, B of zero we are set to be zero, there is no term. Everything's a multiple of A. Do you see a little A in everything? In which case I've got a form for BN divided by BA is the rest of it. There's a formula. And if BA, if, if, if N's not a multiple of A, there's a remainder term, there's the remainder. I've got a formula for it. All I was doing is counting the number of paths that go through that cell and miss it. Of those that remain, those that go through there, that miss it. Of those that remain, those that go through there, those that miss it. All the way along, counting all the possible options that occur there about going through the eighth, two eighth, three eighth, two eighth cell. Whoa, 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 there it is. A formula for the way to do the quotient. Now, does anyone need to know that formula? Probably not. Um, I've actually known this form for a little while now and I've, I've not published it, it's just been out there. Because uh, I was just curious about it. There has to be a formula, there it is. But what I love about here is the process to get to that formula. This thinking is lovely. Um, I can see that. There's no way I'm gonna memorize that, but now I can reconstruct it. I just constructed it from memory just then. 
Fabulous. The power of the visuals, actually I love the power of this two line honeycomb for the B numbers. So your challenge now is take your favorite, favorite B number identity, your favorite Himachandra number identity, your favorite Fibonacci number identity, whatever you want to call it. I wonder if you can prove it by playing with paths in honeycombs just like this. And if you want real research territory, this is all based on a row of two in a honeycomb structure. What if you had a row of three honeycomb cells? What structure is there? Do we have a, a new variation of the B numbers with all magic like of the same nature as this? Whoa, mind blowing. Go for it, give it a try, play with it.